management already committed to diesel power. They ordered it scrapped with less than five years operation. The next three run paths are the pacemaker, the advanced Commodore Vanderbilt, and the Chicago one. Kiefer took over as chief engineer in 1926. The Pacific type locomotives on which the New York Central had relied for so long were no longer able to shoulder the load. Mainline trains operated in several sections because the Pacific could handle a maximum of 12 cars. Kiefer's answer was the class J1 Hudson. Their steaming power was immense. They could hit 75 miles an hour with a 26 car train with ease. With 15 heavyweight Pullmans, they could hold 100 miles an hour continuously on level track. Their introduction permitted sharp reduction in both costs and running times. The 20th century went to an 18-hour schedule, New York to Chicago. Many extra sections were eliminated. Between 1927 and 1937, some 275 Hudsons were built. Later models had centipede tenders. These 14-wheel monsters had the largest coal capacity in the world, 46 tons. Between New York and Chicago, or St. Louis, only a single refueling stop was required. The last 50, Class J-3A, built in 1937, were called Super Hudsons. Between 1938 and 1948, these were the locomotives that carried the famous Henry Dreyfus Streamline Shroud. All engine and tender wheels had roller bearings. 25 had the box pox style drivers and 25 had skull and disc drivers. The engine was designed for 275 pounds boiler pressure, but this was so high it actually bent the side rods and pressure had to be reduced to 265. A number of design changes, bigger combustion chambers and so forth, added up to an engine with a smaller boiler, one which used 15% less coal and water, yet an engine with a 20% increase in horsepower. Permissible speeds rose to 120 miles an hour. The schedule of the century was cut to just 16 hours. Between Toledo and Elkhart, the timetable called for an average of 74 miles an hour. Passenger trains behind time sometimes averaged better than 90 miles an hour on this 133 mile stretch. A 482 wheel arrangement is generally referred to as a mountain type engine. On the billiard flat water level route of the New York Central, such a term was an anathema. The Central called their 482s Mohawks. They built some 600 of them, the first more than 10 years before the arrival of the Hudson. It wasn't until the late 20s that the need for improvement was felt. Mohawks were intended for fast freight and passenger service. And indeed, they served admirably in heavy freight service. When it came to fast passenger, however, they proved unstable. Poor balance of the reciprocating gear forced the Central to limit them to 60 miles an hour. Kiefer went to work to produce the Central's first true dual service locomotive. Drivers went from 69 to 72 inches. Boiler pressure from 225 to 250 pounds. Horsepower from 4,200 to 5,200. Box pock drivers were specified and some engines got roller bearings. The end result was a smooth running locomotive that could make 80 miles an hour with the century on the way out and come back comfortably with a heavy freight.
The Central called a 484 type wheel arrangement a Niagara. 484s, or Northerns as other roads call them, had been around for some time before Paul Kiefer began planning the ultimate dual service locomotive. His plans were interrupted by World War II, and because of the advent of the diesel locomotive, only 27 were ever built. But the world has never seen their equal. And the final modification, the S2, challenged the economy and productivity of the diesel itself. Boiler pressure was 275 pounds. Special tandem side rods were introduced to absorb the tremendous thrust of some 6,600 horsepower. The boiler diameter was increased to 100 inches. To reduce weight, aluminum was introduced wherever possible, cab, smoke lifters, and so forth. Roller bearings were used throughout, and the reciprocating parts were so well balanced that two men could push both locomotive and the immense centipede tender. In terms of overall efficiency, the Niagara ranked number one worldwide. Whether the records of utilization were calculated as miles per month, miles between shopping, or hours on the road per year, they were never equaled by any other locomotive. Although the Niagara was lighter than many of them, no other northern type engine ever equaled their power up. taking water on the fly. Niagara, with its long, smooth-surfaced boiler, epitomized the streamlined Henry Dreyfus look that began with his redesign of the 20th Century Limited in 1938. The steam dome vanished, the stack shrunk almost out of sight, and the sand dome was squashed flat across the boiler. The uncluttered cylinder that resulted resembled the jacket of a high-speed rifle bullet. The reasons for all this, however, were anything but aesthetic. 
other northern type locomotives, the Norfolk and Western J class, Southern Pacific GS fours, Union Pacific eight hundreds, and the Northern Pacific A four were all more than sixteen feet high. The Niagara was only fifteen feet. The engine's contemporary look was the fortuitous result of the designer's scramble to squeeze a huge 100-inch diameter boiler, which was required for adequate steam production, into the extremely tight clearances of the eastern end of the New York Central system, and still leave room for 79-inch drivers. The wheelbase for the Niagara, as well as most other Northerns, was about 97 feet. In order to fit the Niagara, with its enormous tender, onto the New York Central turntables, however, it was necessary to allow a nine and a half foot overhang beyond the last wheels of the tender. Smoke deflectors were not supposed to lift the smoke. Rather, they were used to reduce a vacuum that was produced around the cab at high speeds and hampered the engineer's visibility. you are about to see were made by Dr. Jefferson Weishar of Nyack, New York in the early 1950s. We open at the Jersey City Terminal of the Central Railroad of New Jersey with the Pacific backing in to pick up a fan trip. The B&O and the Reading shared these facilities. The next four shots are of commuters at Fanwood, New Jersey.
This is Dunellen, New Jersey. The Camelback is backing down to pick up an inbound commuter. B&O Limited headed for Chicago. Passing the deadline of the Jersey Central. The famed Erie Berkshire. Jervis Yard. K-1 Pacific leaving Pearl River, New York. Pacific at Nanowit. Lackawanna Pacific with commuter at Waco, New Jersey. Erie Berkshire on a local freight. Pacifics at Spring Valley, the starting point for commuter trains to Jersey City and Secaucus. Spark Hill, New York. Lackawanna Pacific's at Toeco. Another K-5 Pacific on a commuter at Waldwick, New Jersey. This is a mainline engine used on the Erie Limited and the Lake Cities Limited.
This is the famed Ready Track at Harmon, where steam power was swapped for electric for the final leg of the journey underground in Manhattan. These afternoon shots show Hudson's and Super Hudson's being readied for the evening rush of commuters and limiteds north along the Hudson. Backing through the loop. Closing scenes are of the dawn parade of inbound commuters and limiteds. A mohawk near Peekskill. Computers are followed by a Baldwin shark-nosed diesel. The New York Central Main Line was four track, both above and below this point. A Niagara on the Commodore Vanderbilt. 